thank you very much. And uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, this rather boastful title of making computers actually useful to historical linguists. And uh, so uh, I would like to start my talk by uh, saying that uh, I'm very happy that I'm talking in this particular seminar because uh, I think uh, with Joey, we uh, kind of share a very um, a kind of general uh, like uh, love for the particular. So if we talk about um, computers and historical linguistics, the first thing that kind of comes to your mind in general for, for people who uh, have heard anything about it is, is a paradigm like this. So uh, what I call tree crunching. So like you ask specialists of a language group with a already mature tradition of historical linguistics, and you ask them to uh, encode tradition to a couple of uh, binary trees, whether this language had this or, or not, whether this word in this language is cognate to that word to that language or not. And you just uh, put it all into a kind of phylogenetic algorithm and you, you get a tree. And uh, yeah, that's nice, but I don't think that's the thing that's the most appealing to historical linguists because uh, I put uh, my basic misgivings for, to, to this kind of paradigm in three, in three um, subtitles. So uh, first it's, uh, it's the, Kind of the inverse, because uh, in general, computers are supposed to help us doing things. But now computer is going to run an algorithm and we uh, encode things so that computers can read them easily. That's not the uh, happiest thing ever. Uh, the second thing is this kind of big conclusionism, which is why I am um, begin my talk with a nod to our host, uh, which is that uh, the idea that, you know, historical linguistics uh, is, uh, is not an end to itself, but a means to uh, a tree, which can be compared with uh, genetic trees or um, a large historical movements of people, uh, things like that. Uh, of course, those things are extremely interesting. I think everyone, um, spend some time uh, listening to cracks pot series about this kind of things but uh, that's not actually makes uh, historical linguists fun for us and that's not makes our fruits of labor useful for people who speak their languages or who uh, or who identify uh, uh, ancestrally or regionally with those languages and the third thing is that uh, it relies on traditions uh, for language groups that already had the tradition. So it doesn't produce anything new uh, for us. So uh, how about having it the way around? So let's have computers in service of human beings and let's have computers to help us create and perfect hypotheses that are classical, that actually interests us and that are concrete on this specific trait of this specific language or language group and also we want to have and um, also we wanted to uh, work in a sort of explanatory uh, sorry exploratory context so that we computers help us to create new traditions to bring a rigorous historical linguistics to places to language families where it didn't exist before okay so uh, the idea of CAPO is that of a reconstruction assistant. So like, uh, what's a word processor? Well, that's what you use to write documents. So that like the documents exist inside the word processor and by interacting with a word processor, you write your documents. Okay, so a CAD uh, is used for technical drawings or designs and a proof assistant in mathematics is to use to can create computer verify formal proofs. So, that's the basic idea of a reconstruction assistant. So the linguist or the linguists interact with this reconstru reconstruction assistant 
and it uh, as software it takes a, uh, a bunch of input which is basically the lexica of daughter languages and you gradually elaborate the assistant helps you to elaborate the linguistic reconstruction your hypothesis about the history of this language group and uh, at a certain point when you think that the thing is good enough it can be output into a kind of an etymological dictionary or other kinds of you know, handbooks of the of the language group okay uh, let's say that uh, can Historical linguistics is not like the hardest problem ever for, uh, for computers. I mean, a lot of historical linguistics is just a string search and replace. A lot of other things are just a statistics. So in principle, it should, we should be using computers everywhere. Uh, but of course, that's not what happens. And yeah, we basically use computers as uh, well as uh, word processors and yeah, so with maybe some custom Ruby scripts or Ruby, Ruby scripts or Excel magic to, uh, to, to get something done, but it's not uh, computational. Uh, and uh, we have recently a couple of, of great um, surveys on the computation and computerized methods. And like for every single subtask, for every single step in the general workflow of historical linguistics, uh, you actually get very, very good computational and computerized methods. So what do we need? Well, uh, let's say the technology is already here and what is needed is engineering. So um, you just need to, uh, when you have a context, like when you actually want to do something and you also actually want, you actually, actually want to uh, involve computers in the thing and see what we can create. So, that's the basic idea. Okay, uh, so let's talk about some of the previous approaches and from, uh, in, from an engineering point of view, which is to say, uh, how can it be made to produce concrete results of a good quality? So let's focus on one of the most important tasks when we consider historical comparative linguistics, which is that of cognitive assignment or cognitive determination or cognitive or whatever. So um, you have a bunch of words in, uh, in different languages and you try to partition them into different cognitive sets. So this word, is cognitive to that word, to that word. So you put them all together and you call it a cognate set. Uh, I call it cock set, but uh, it's the same. Okay. Uh, so there are two basic computational approaches to uh, cognate assignment. Uh, the first one is um, automatic cognate detection. So basically it's an algorithm, uh, which is quantitative kind of language agnostic. You just give it an input, the word list, and it tells you which word is cognate with which. That's the first idea. The second idea is that of a back projection etymology. So basically, you have a already you know already the phonological history of the language group pretty well and you encode them into, let's call them programs that uh, reconstruct the uh, every daughter language form into a proto-language form. And you kind of crisscross, you triangulate the results together and you see what can be um, fit into coxes with um, what others. So uh, automatic Cognate detection has a very long history. Uh, the earliest uh, approaches are um, actually pre-computer, like you like you devise a kind of method for three or four research assistants. Uh, they still had research assistants at the area, and and you yeah you have them 
crunch words like a computer in a certain manner so you can uh, have um, so you can gain a rough first idea of what uh, kind of cockiness can exist so um, as uh, as soon as the thing gets computerized and uh, have some uh, actual engineering constraints you uh, the basic methods rely on actual phonetic similarity which is like kind of a no no to historical linguistics uh, for historical linguists because uh, yeah this this kind of thing that basically you have um, you know in persian bad means bad so yeah uh, persian bad is cognitive english bad of course the world doesn't look like this uh, but uh, those algorithms will pick up those uh, coincidental lookalikes while fail on uh, uh, non-obvious cognates. So uh, uh, what we actually use here is this uh, method uh, developed by Johannes List uh, called Lexstat, uh, which uses a pairwise sequence alignment to, to closely mimic the behavior of comparative method. Basically, it uh, takes words, like assume that words that might be cognate or actually cognate, so uh, so you get a kind of score of correspondence, and you use the correspondence score uh, computed from the word list itself to uh, to determine the. So it's a self-referencing. It's very robust, and it's um, most importantly, it uh, fixes this problem of over real over reliance on the actual sound value, and it's has a robust independent behavior. Uh, so yeah, the uh, the algorithms, uh, uh, especially the new ones like Lex, that are uh, great. So if you use it on like on some kind of German, English, Dutch, French thing, it it gives a ninety four ninety five percent accuracy, but it cannot function as as a whole workflow by itself. So um, the question is, what happens afterwards? If you get a bunch of cock sets, how can you uh, how are you supposed to correct them? Uh, so the, uh, this problem itself uh, has like two dimensions. The first thing is, of course, our idea that we want to explore new language groups. So uh, when you develop an algorithm, uh, you basically you think that like there are trained specialists who can have who have this magical power to tell the true cognate from the false. Uh, but uh, this magical power is, uh, is downstream to a very, very mature tradition of historical linguistics. So yeah, so basically, if we don't think um, very deeply about those kind of problems, you're basically asking, com having computers helping people to do things that people can already do, but uh, cannot help people doing things that they don't. And the second stuff is uh, what I will call the Chinese typewriter problem. So even with a linguistic expertise, it's uh, quite non-trivial to think of a way to correct um, cognitive judgments. Uh, so uh, this is a very uh, logical um, kind of inventory of cognitive judgment errors. So overlumping, oversplitting, and uh, misattribution. Uh, I think uh, I tried to talk in like overcorrection or type one, type two errors, but it doesn't work like this. So uh, okay, overlumping is that if the real, the true, the ground truth has like those three cognitive sets, but uh, in fact, algorithm tell you that they are they all belong to one uh, cognitive set, and oversplitting and misattribution. So for over lumping, you need to split one cognate set into several. For over splitting, you need to merge several coxes together. And for misattribution, you need to move stuff uh, around, move, move stuff between coxets. Okay, that's the problem. So if you have this, of course, you know that, okay, here are two um, blues um, thingy you need to put here, and here is one uh, red thingy you need to put here. But 
uh, well, uh, uh, human beings don't have uh, like uh, infinite memory. So basically, if you put those things like uh, physically, visually, sim uh, uh, adjacent, juxtaposed to each other, um, it's very easy to see the pattern. But the problem is that, uh, like, if you actually run uh, the Lexstat algorithm or any kind of algorithm on the actual data, you get uh, you you get a huge bunch of boxes, and uh, and it's just not feasible to uh, to uh, to reassign forms uh, to do this, but across uh, three thousand or ten thousand or more boxes. So uh, here's a perfect analogy. So I once, um, so I took this picture at uh, the one of the libraries in Heidelberg, and yeah, this is um, this is this marvelous machine called the Chinese typewriter. So apparently, uh, uh, you have a kind of mechanical cursor, and you need to locate this mechanical cursor on one of the characters, and you and you and you and you tie and you. Um, Use the button and it uh, moves the the this this uh, this type to the to the paper to to uh, to produce characters. Okay, so imagine uh, this, but like every uh, type is a coxet which contains a um, huge bunch of uh, words, and you need to match this coxet here to this coxet here and while looking at all those no it simply doesn't isn't going to work okay so as a conclusion so automatic cognitive detection is a great it uh, generates excellent uh, first drafts of cognitive assignment, uh, but uh, there's no obvious way for human linguists to correct the result Okay, uh, let's talk about the second idea that is very um, uh, crucial to the development of the CAPA methodology. So uh, we have what I call back projection uh, etymological dictionaries or in short back projection etymology. Uh, so what's the idea? So, uh, okay, it's the idea of uh, Hewson who in, uh, I think it was in the 70s, who had this brilliant idea of producing a computer generated etymological dictionary of Algonquian languages. And here's a sample entry from that dictionary. So if you can see, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, you have the Algonquian word with Cree, uh, Fox, Menominee, Ojibwe. And uh, how do you compile? The, how, how, do you, how can you make this kind of dictionary with a computer? Well, so um, Algonquian is one of the uh, language groups that uh, has an extremely uh, developed uh, tradition of historical linguistics. So like I think uh, back in 20s or 30s, uh, people uh, yeah, understand uh, how the sound changes very well. Uh, even for even for um, a quite difficult language like Menominee, and so uh, what happens is that you can, since you know the historical phonology almost perfectly, you can write programs that back project. Uh, so what's back project? So uh, yeah, uh, you take it's a function that takes uh, an actual proto, uh, no, sorry, an actual daughter language form and produces the, the list of possible proto-language forms. Okay, you have a back projection, and so you can have computer just uh, go through all the daughter language dictionaries and uh, yeah, unite them, see if this one can be reconciled with that one in terms of proto-language form. So it's uh, so uh, from an engineering point of view, uh, it has the unique distinction of be, of actually working. So yeah, here is the dictionary, and uh, why it works is uh, also kind of ex uh, easy to explain because uh, when you have like those uh, three kinds of uh, cognitive judgment errors, okay. Uh, so basically, you just need to. Uh, yeah, uh, get rid of um, uh, 
basically homophones, which is uh, overlumping, and it doesn't require this kind of matching things together in the three thousand or thirty thousand item uh, set. Okay. Uh, so the problem isn't actually what happens afterwards because there is uh, because you just need to split uh, coxets that are already made. So it's is afterwards. The problem lies before. So it has a kind of a, let's say fragile dependency on the perfect historical phonology. So. Uh, so yeah, uh, let's get that into a kind of, I think, um, exaggerated example. So if you just um, have a group and you write some rules and which are quite wrong, and yeah, it uh, compares everything and it gets you fifty etima, uh, sorry, fifteen etima, and uh, yeah, you have your great etymological dictionary of group X that has uh, fifty that has fifteen etima, and you have no absolutely no idea what went wrong because it doesn't give you. Um, when it fails, it fails gracefully. Uh, it, you just uh, have no idea. So uh, it works only in this very limited context of like scaling up a reliable theory of historical phonology to a to an etymological dictionary. And but uh, but we are trying to do something else, which is this exploratory stuff. Uh, when you have a group that you don't really know about, then what you can do about it. Okay, so while for the algorithms, the challenge lies in how can you find a way to correct the results, here the challenge lies in the, in the need to uh, have a way to, for linguists to discover and gradually refine the historical phonology. Okay, so that's the basic idea. So yeah, uh, for both, uh, if we look at if we look at them like uh, um, from this kind of engineering workflow point of view, uh, they have uh, they both have this um, fatal uh, uh, fatal disadvantage of being uh, uh, non explan uh, non exploratory non iterative so yeah uh, you need to already have a perfect knowledge of the group you're working on before you can enlist the help of computer into it and uh, of course if you know the group uh, perfectly why do you need a computer okay so uh, let's uh, distill this uh, discussion into the design goals so uh, in order to have something that we actually would like, would want to use, uh, the first uh, goal is what I call uh, optimal human computer cooperation. Uh, so yeah, uh, so the ideal is to have the computer working like some kind of very intelligent, uh, earnest assistant or um, more like the student and you're the director and yeah, uh, the student, um, uh, does everything to the um, ability, but uh, then ask you, okay, so uh, how can I get this? So you get to generate the, so, so, so you do the uh, interesting bits, generating hypothesis and uh, giving intuitive judgments and computers uh, do the work like uh, enforcing consistency, keeping track of details and crunching dictionaries. That's the ideal. And the second design goal is incremental improvement. So yeah, so as we have seen for the for the kind of um, back projecting etymology thing, so it really needs a good uh, hypothesis of historical phonology, and so uh, which in most cases we don't have. So yeah, the a good system should encourage hypotheses to be gradually built and refined. A crude set of hypotheses should still reward the linguist with more and better information so that the linguist can later use those new information gained from the uh, bad hypothesis to make a good hypothesis. And uh, here is a third uh, thing, which is a non-destructiveness. So yeah, basically 
you need to think really hard so that uh, if the human linguist does something, then uh, yeah, it shouldn't be thrown away except when the human linguists themselves think the thing is wrong. Okay, so yeah, let's talk about uh, our uh, workflow, which is this thing called CAPA, uh, Computer Assisted Supported Language Reconstruction. Uh, so the context is that we, uh, in this uh, in this framework of the uh, ERC project Beyond Boundaries, and we want to do an etymological dictionary of Burmish languages. Okay, so we have a, a lot of digitalized data, and uh, but now, yeah, we're working on this, um, working on just a finding a way to gracefully let us uh, make this make a first version of the dictionary i think uh, from the six languages in a certain uh, parallel lexicon kind of source okay the context is that of monosyllabic languages so uh, okay um Okay, so some people think that monosyllabic languages uh, means that most of the words in those languages like have uh, are monosyllabic, which uh, doesn't exist, which doesn't really exist, I think. Most, um, but uh, it's still a very important uh, kind of typological type. Uh, so yeah, the morphology is mostly compositional and the productive morpheme boundary coincides with a uh, syllable boundary. And also, so there is um, little that happens uh, between syllables, either diachronically or syn synchronically. So with monosyllabic languages, um, basically it uh, kind of allows us to like forget uh, about words and take syllables as the basic unit of, the, as, of phonological evolution and, and uh, etymologization. So yeah, here's an example of like the um, cognitive sets for monosyllabic languages. So, uh, for example, uh, brain in Maru is basically head brain and uh, head hair is head hair. So all those and and this word hair is like a, a flesh hair. So this head thing goes here, this in brain goes here and the head hair thing also goes here while the second syllable is going to be um, etymologized on its own in this uh, in another uh, coxet. That's the basic idea of uh, monosyllabic languages. It saves us a lot of work. Uh, and yeah, uh, so CAPO is developed for monosyllabic languages with its limitations. So uh, later, if we're going to make it more useful for other kinds of languages, we need to think more about it. So the actual document, the CAPO, workflow allows us to work on is what I call the bipartite hypothesis, which is made of two parts. So you have the coccyx and you have the phonological history. So, okay, the coccyx are the coccyx. So a word in the general case or a syllable in this monosyllabic case uh, belongs to a coccyx, uh, nothing fancy here. And the other thing is uh, what we call a phonological history. So basically, yeah, you write them in as finite state transducers in the firmware language. So uh, I don't have time to talk about trans how great transducers are today, but basically it's um, the idea is that it gets you to write uh, historical evolution in SPE style, which everybody kind of knows. And also um, permit, and also like automatically permits you to um, project forwards and project backwards. So yeah, that's what we need. So first, you uh, so the phonological history is actually composed of like uh, two parts. So uh, we're looking at this example where proto Burmish ba gives Mochan po. So. First, you need to um, define what the what a legal syllable in the proto language is. So, for example, here, well, you yeah, the legal syllable is composed of the initial and the rhyme, and the initials are those. 
and the rhyme R, A, and E. So you see that ba, uh, well, it um, B fits in the initial here and R fits in the rhyme here. Nothing fancy. Then we need to define the individual sound changes that lead from the proto language uh, to Mo Chang. So, for example, here's a rule of devoicing which turns B into P. And here is a rule that turns R into O. So that we get actually, we get BO from BA. And finally, uh, we have this uh, transducer called Mo Chang which defines not any legal Ngo Chang syllable, but uh, like an per a perfectly inherited Ngo Chang syllable, which is a lot of derived from Proto-Burmese, uh, proto uh, excluding loans, analogy, and other shenanigans. Uh, so yeah, so how do you define it? Well, you take the, uh, uh, you take the actual, the uh, proto syllable, you take the proto phonotactics and you apply the sound changes one by one on it. So, first you apply the devising, then you apply R to all. And so, here you get uh, essentially an ordered list of sound changes applied to the proto language syllable. Uh, so, uh, uh, an interesting point of the CAPER view of hypothesis or the data will, on which the, the theory on which you actually work on is that uh, you, you don't actually do any um, uh, proto forms. So, uh, I mean, if you take a look here, you might uh, think that, well, uh, the linguists need to write a uh, glottal uh, stop O and H uh, for the head. No, uh, uh, it shouldn't work like this because uh, basically the protoforms should not be provided by the human linguist, but inferred from the phonological history and the daughter language form. So we get a toy example here. It means tears. And uh, yeah, so this word uh, reconstructs uh, in Achang AOC, reconstructs to, sorry, this word B uh, reconstructs to all those different proto Burmese syllables, and this word reconstructs to all those, and this word reconstructs to all those. So you do some kind of set um, a theory operation. Uh, in fact, it doesn't always work. So yeah, um, it's some kind of com complex complex heuristics to tell that uh, the the actual reconstruction of the of the whole coxet is likely to be B. Okay, that's how it's supposed to work. Uh, so why do we do this? Because it permits a kind of rapid iteration of phonological history. So if you do any kind of reconstruction like uh, on hand, um, you one of one of the um, one of the uh, not very thorny but a uh, very annoying problem is this kind of thing. So, like if you if you change your hypothesis, and so uh, if you change your proto language um, phonotactics, and uh, every time you do such a change, a lot of the proto language forms need to be replaced. And so, yeah, basically we just get lazy and, and like never update uh, your um, reconstruction, except when you have like uh, a complete new vision of how things are supposed to work. And then, you know, this kind of things, which are uh, still quite counterproductive because I think, uh, and we will see later that um, actually the best way to, to, to make good, uh, to make good reconstruction, to make good hypothesis is to iterate very quickly on the, on the whole theory. And uh, so we got transducers, we got the, this, uh, phonological history, and what are they used for? Well, <clears throat> the first insight of the CAPER methodology is that you just um, blindly do a backward projection whenever possible and very often forward projection. And that provides a lot of 
context to the linguist. So for example, we get this word here, uh, cloudy. So yeah, the, in, the inferred uh, reconstruction is zu x. So uh, in this, in for the ASI word mao uh, zao, for example, the syllable zao is, uh, so uh, yeah, the computer runs the transducer backwards to do a projection from Zhao and it sees that it is it is reconstructed as Zhu X. So it uh, accords, it is uh, harmonious, it's uh, it conforms with the with the with the projected with the projected uh, reconstruction of the whole uh, coxet. So you get a tech here and you get different kinds of <clears throat> Crosses. So um, here's a kind of crosses. So, for example, Mao Zhao and Zhao, at least according to our um, current hypothesis, it can only come from Zhu, not Zhu. So, here it um, reconstructs this word back. Uh, it produces Zhu and tells you that, uh, well, uh, it does have a reconstruction, but it's not a reconstruction that conforms to the projected reconstruction of the coxet. And uh, here's another example, which is mukta, uh, which uh, so if you get ta in maru, you can get a dupe or dip. And uh, yeah, it basically tells you that. So you see that here, maybe for ju, maybe you, uh, your um, phonological history is wrong. Maybe it is a regular Lautgesetzlich uh, reflex. And here, of course, uh, what's wrong is not the is not the phonological theory. But you should move it out to create another coxet. Okay, so that's the basic idea uh, of uh, back projecting everywhere, which uh, gives you a lot of context, and we'll take a look at that later also. And so the basic organization of the K per workflow is basically what you would expect. So you pre-process the source word list to a kind of computer readable form, and um, you get the bootstrapping stage where the Lexstat algorithm generates the first draft of the cognitive assignment. And then you get an iterative improvement before deciding that you are going to publish that as a etymological dictionary. So the um, interesting thing here is the actual iterative improvement. So the idea is that, so basically, since we have this bipartite hypothesis, so you're supposed to, like, when you make a better transducer, then it could uh, somehow contribute into the uh, into the coxet ed editing process to create better coxets and vice versa. So you can have this zigzag. And you you work on transducers and then you work on coxets with um, new stuff. You feel very happy and you get your new stuff and you use that back to create better transducers and you feel very happy and yet better, yet better and until you get the final result. So let's uh, talk about this uh, iterative um, improvement in both uh, in both parts. So the more interesting part is the, this uh, that of uh, cognitive assignment. So how are you going to solve those uh, seemingly intractable problems of um, of creating coxets? Well, so here is this misattribution coxet error. And so, well, I well, I put it like this. Since I put it like this, then of course, uh, how are you going to correct them? Like dragging them around. Okay, so uh, with back projection, you get a very a uh, nice um, stuff. Let's just take a look. Oh. So we just looked at this cloudy word and maybe something sh doesn't really belong here. So yeah, we're going to working on it. So we create a new coxet. So it's just as easy as dragging the word from the old coxet to the new coxet. 
and uh, take a look at how the how the how the reconstruction actually change. Okay, now we put DAP here since DAP it doesn't have a reconstruction according to our current theory. So there, there's no reconstruction for this coxet. Then we drag the other DAP here. Okay, this one does have a reconstruction, which is a beep or a doop. So it is inferred that basically this, uh, this new coxet likely has a reconstruction of beep or a doop. Okay, so that's the basic idea. You allow linguists to drag words around and you use uh, transducers to, to, um, to you provide this um, most useful kind of context that can be provided to the linguist. Okay. Of course, um, we just saw that uh, on our board, we just have uh, three uh, coxes and how is that possible? I mean, we have a lot of them. Well, so uh, that's a problem that needs to be looked into uh, very seriously. So uh, here's what we want. So first, uh, partial visibility. The idea is that you you shouldn't let yourself like be overwhelmed with this with the ocean of coxes. No, it, it wouldn't work. And so, uh, either like you wish to prioritize them. So maybe some are more important, more in more reliable, or likely to end up in the smaller etymological lexicon or whatever. But if you don't have that, then just give me some uh, some uh, random uh, cog sets so that I don't have to work on uh, three thirty thousand of them at once. Uh, the second uh, idea is that of grouping. So since we have this oversplitting or misattribution relation where we really do need the cog sets to be visible to the human eye on on the same screen in order to for human beings to realize that okay maybe we should drag it uh, from here or maybe we should um, merge two coxes together so we need to find a way to uh, group together the coxes that are likely to have an oversplitting or misattribution relation okay here's what we do so First, we have a, a criterion called a reliable coxis. So the idea is that, well, um, since in the etymological dictionary, usually a word, uh, netimon, is um, justified by more than one example. So yeah, at least uh, it wouldn't do us any harm if we just uh, declare that uh, we just we only want to see the coxes which already has a reconstruction which is justified by words from more than one language. And uh, the second idea is that of pause. So basically, you take a reliable coxes and you also you try to see if there are other coxes, reliable or unreliable, that has the same, uh, that can have the same, um, sorry, that can have the same reconstruction. So you make an equivalence class, you just partition the coxes into different boards where the boards are those where the coxes in the boards um, just uh, share one or more reconstructions. So uh, what does that do? Well, in doing this with transducers, you make only one small part of coxes visible. And also since they're visible in boards, uh, you uh, Every board contains coxes that are very likely to have an oversplitting or misattribution relation, since and since they since some of their words already share a reconstruction. So yeah, they may be very 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 related. Okay, boards also uh, offers us this uh, task management benefit of uh, chunking it up to manageable bits, so that. Uh, if we take a look at uh, some lovely boards. Okay. 
Okay. Here's a board. Here's a board with a lot of cock sets, but not that lot. Here's another board. Notice that, for example, um, here is a cock set that is reconstructed to ban. Here's another, and some of the and some of the glosses are all we all or whole. So yeah, they should be merged together. Here's a rather large cock set. Here's a rather large board. We can merge things together. Here's a very good uh, board with, which contains basically only one etymon. However, there's, uh, there is one word that doesn't look the same, which is this mia ye. This ye is just a word for water, but the, but the algorithm failed to understand that ye is not the same as the other p words. So let's move it out of it. And here we get um, a word that is reconstructed as big, and that means to go to battle. So, and here you get the same meaning, but uh, the the actual the actual reconstruction, even the uh, superficial form, kind of allows you to make this decision. And of course, the fire short is um, the related idea to to go to battle. So you can merge all of those cocktails together. Cool. And let's take a look at. So this is the. Uh, I'm not really working here. Uh, uh, this is just uh, the results of the first fishing. So it's uh, you don't have a lot of things here. And uh, yeah, uh, okay, that's the basic idea of it. So uh, this process of using transducers to uh, put board, to put coxes into visible boards we call fishing. And why do we call it fishing? Because basically with every improvement on the phonological history on the transducers, then two things happen, which makes more reliable coxets um, visible to us. So if you do a new bad transducer for a new language or you improve a transducer for a language that already has one, then either uh, more coxets are just as reliable or some little small coxets uh, actually have a reconstruction and can be attached to another reliable coxet. That's the basic idea. So we have this little nice fish icon to, to indicate the new coxet that's just when that just got fished up. So uh, here's how the fishing works. So we color code uh, everything in this way. So um, this um, gray box uh, represents the uh, results of Lickstat algorithm, which is a huge bunch of possible coxes waiting to be uh, corrected. So somehow I'm being very hand wavy here. Uh, you um, book yourself up and put a, to put together a rough first draft of historical phonology. And with fishing, you actually fish out a lot of uh, coxes into this red portion, which I call visible or bordered. Then with the cognate assignment interface, the one that we just uh, seen a lot of videos of, uh, human linguists can edit the first bunch of bodied coxes into human curated high quality coxes. Then you get better hypotheses of historical phonology and it fish out coxes with uh, this, this better historical phonology and you all edit them again using the interface. 
so that's the idea. So with this uh, fishing thing, you basically um, finally have an incremental kind of way out from the from the conundrum of too many coxets. Okay, uh, here's an interesting thing that I wish to talk about a bit, uh, the dregs, or basically because your first uh, transducers aren't perfect, they are going to keep, pick up some things that um, with later transducers, the fishing algorithm thinks that uh, they shouldn't belong on the board. So they get assigned this uh, cute uh, dead fish icon, and if we take a if we take an actual look at those dead fish things, it's very interesting. So, for example, this means tile, like the tile you put on the rooftop of the houses. And the first thing you notice that is that uh, they look a little bit too similar for for actual cognates. Maybe this should be o, or maybe this should be u. But no, they are wa, va, va. And the second thing is that they, they, they receive quite disparate um, uh, reconstructions. So this one is wa with the zero tone, and this one is wa with the H tone, and this one doesn't have a reconstruction. It isn't uh, inherited looking syllable. So what happens? Of course, if you speak Chinese, you know that it's uh, it's basically the, the, the Chinese word for tile. So, uh, with uh, so you see basically that uh, by using um, algorithms and transducers together, it also um, gives uh, it also weeds out the learns if you are interested only in the inherited part of the lexicon. Okay, so uh, here's the idea. So we're trying to build an iterative workflow which allow you to uh, work on one of the two parts of the bipartite hypothesis. And uh, yeah, you get transduce. Uh, yeah, when you get better transducers, it can help you to fish coxes and also transducers kind of contribute directly to the UI. So you are helped and spoiled by the transducers to, to create better coxes, which maybe can be used to create better transducers. So some discussion. So uh, this, uh, this uh, interface and this efficient workflow basically um, combines the two approaches previously discussed, that of automatic cognitive detection and that of uh, back projection etymology. Uh, so, um, so for the math type, uh, you know, if you do math or if you do math or physics, you, you know the idea of like one object um, devolves into degrades into another in an in an extreme context. So if you imagine that the um, cognate detection algorithm says that every word is not cognate with every word or with any word, and it's basically degrades into back projection etymology. And yeah, it's basically both, but of course uh, it's the actual combination that is the interesting thing. So it uh, uh, kind of combines the advantages of both methods, um, uh, especially with regards to the scope of data. So uh, automatic uh, cognitive detection algorithms are um, uh, not very fussy about uh, small imperfections, but on the other hand, it misses a uh, non-obvious cognitive, the kind that gives you aha. Uh, I remember like learning, I think last year, it's really ridiculous that I had learned last year that uh, enough is genug. It's, it's, it's um, trivial when you think of it, but uh, if you know the historical phonology, but it wouldn't click and it wouldn't click to the algorithm either. And uh, back projection etymology uh, gives you those ahas, but uh, uh, if there is a little imperfection either in the actual forms or in your version of the historical phonology, then it just um, it doesn't, doesn't appear. So, uh, on the one hand, we don't want this over making data invisible. But on the other hand, we do want to know if modern reflexes are loud visits or not. So um, the caper way uh, 
by putting the human linguist in the center of this approach um, provides both kind of information. So yeah, it doesn't it gives um, the kind of information that the algorithms give and also the kind of information, the, uh, the back projection, a uh, really strict, rigorous etymological method give. And um, then it gives you all this information and it lets you to decide uh, what to do with it. Okay, uh, now let's talk about transducers. So the thing with transducers is that, uh, well, while you can have uh, those like basic stuff, um, you, know, you have the algorithm creating the coxes and you can correct the coxes. For transducers, you need to create things ex nihilo and which makes the situation quite frustrating. So here's what we want. So first, you, to create uh, your your historical technology, you need to, something to work on. You need your word that you think maybe are cognitive with each other, and you need a visualization mechanism to to give you patterns to make you think about things. And also, since um, transducers or any kind of hypothesis of uh, historical phonology are unmanageable, fragile juggernauts. You do need some way to um, decompose it into discrete tasks of manageable size with instant feedback so you know you did something good and not bad. Okay. So uh, we work from uh, correspondence patterns. So the old masters of um, historical phonology, of course, thinks that the correspondence are the real things and the reconstructions, or you may call them here restitution. They're not real, they're just some kind of algebraic uh, notation of the real correspondence patterns. Okay, it doesn't really work like this, but it gives us a quite good idea of like uh, its importance in the whole strategy. So in the context that uh, we, is kind of where we, are from. So for the linguistics of China or Southeast Asia or uh, other Sino-Tibetan languages, there is this kind of thing of uh, putting actual uh, attested forms uh, into uh, correspondence pattern uh, tables. So here's an example. So here is the reconstruction of Wang Fu Shi of Proto Miao, and you get this J um, Proto proto initial and so yeah you get you you get you really get a, a, you know he tries to be um, exhaustive you put all of those uh, words here and so you can see that they correspond with each other and here's an here's a less exhaustive example is um they are born reconstructing prototype. So you get four legs and five words, but the basic idea is the same. And also here, the idea that of marking, uh, of explicitly marking uh, non-regular uh, correspondences. So for example, here it says that, uh, it says that the tone isn't regular. Here it says that the vowel isn't regular, so that's the basic idea. Okay, in the most general case, uh, generating uh, correspondence patterns from coxes is a generally hard problem because uh, basically to, to do this kind of pattern, you need uh, alignment, which means that you, you need to take leche and latte and lapti and le and kind of fit them together into, into this kind of table where so you can say that you have Spanish uh, L, which corresponds to Italian L, which corresponds to A Romanian L, which corresponds to French L and etc. etc. Uh, however, uh, first we notice that we don't really need the actual, uh, let's say, the actual algebraic expression of the correspondence patterns. So we need them mostly as a visualization tool. So uh, I think we can all argue that um, uh, nothing which corresponds with T, which corresponds with P, which corresponds with nothing, completely misses the point. And uh, so, but. Uh, if you if you don't look at this, 
but if you use this thing as as a kind of index to to generate this kind of uh, China or Southeast Asia kind of uh, uh, complete tables with examples, uh, it it makes the pattern extremely clear. So yeah, uh, even if it's nothing to T to P to nothing, which is uh, completely uh, asinine, but uh, we look at this and we, and we get a lot of ideas on where this might come from. Okay, so the actual alignment is not important. And of course, uh, at least for the current incarnation of the Kuiper methodology, we're working with monosyllabic languages. So we do a very trivial thing, alignment by phonotactics. Uh, so yeah, this, this is like, uh, this is like, um, um, uh, uh, phonology. This is like a linguistic theory of uh, 1000 AD, and you just uh, di divide your syllable into initial, medial, nucleus, uh, coda, and tone. And so, yeah, you uh, for every language, the the linguist writes a kind of parser which passes those things into into the schema. And uh, also, the schema is combined this way. So initial means initial plus medial, and then you get medial, and you get rhyme, which is medial plus nucleus plus coda, and you get tone. So yeah, the important thing is that you see this is. Um, um, you, you don't take, uh, you don't need to take alignment as some kind of very rarefied thing, but as a tool to help you to see the actual patterns. Okay, so uh, here's how it works. Uh, so, for example, we have those languages. So we're going to study Atsi. The interface is very primitive, but anyway, it's, it's me doing the programming, so how can it be otherwise? Okay, so you get the correspondence, you wait a little bit for to get the, rep the report, and so it, it gives you a title, a chapter titles, so initials, rhymes, and you give those, you get those rhymes with everywhere you get the actual tested forms and also the back projections. Let's turn two languages into three languages. So we'll still need to wait a little bit to get the actual results. Here they are. Okay, let's look at rhymes again. There is uh, absolutely no uh, interface. So yeah, you just uh, search around in this document. Okay, so yeah, here is a turn correspondence. Okay, that's the basic idea. And uh, with back projection, uh, here's a really great example of how back projection uh, really helps you in reconstructing stuff. So, for example, we see this uh, we see this uh, correspondence pattern. So, je in A Chang Long Chuan and Xian Dao correspond to V in Ati and the V in Maru. So for example, for okay, chicken, cock, hen, or the same thing, but yeah, they should be much together. But um, yeah, there are basically two examples. And so for bark, it's grap and vap and re, and this one is gjua, vo and ro. So yeah, when you just take a look at this, then je, v, and re, of course, uh, it's really difficult to think of any hypothesis that can like uh, explain them. But of course, you don't need to do that. Uh, so uh, the idea is to enable you to do this uh, gradual refining when you create a hypothesis on the largest, the most regular stuff. And what did that give you? Well, uh, after you created them and you take a look here, okay, so basically it's very clear, easy to see that um, you, have a, you have a grouping which makes uh, Archang and Xiandao have a gzh, while uh, have a proto-language gr, while Asi and Maru have proto-language r. 
So yeah, basically for those two words and, and probably others, you get a gr in some languages and a r in some other languages, and you can and you can like make more sophisticated hypothesis from here. So yeah, uh, uh, this is uh, marvelous because, like in the real world, uh, you you need to uh, you need to basically maybe someone reconstructs a bad proto Burmish and you read this article and you write another article saying that oh, okay no uh, 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 how are, uh, how are you so stupid in missing this obvious. Um, um, a correspondence pattern, uh, but of course, um, when when your whole mind is taken by um, uh, by by those kind of uh, very basic laborious work of uh, collecting um, correspondence patterns, you can't really see that. And here, uh, you can really uh, evolve the hypothesis in a very in a very effortless manner. Okay, so uh, the next problem is uh, debugging. So yeah, you have ordered uh, sound changes, or you have uh, feedings and bleedings and whatever. So yeah, it's like the Chinese um, saying: you 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 make a change to one piece, and the whole thing moves. So yeah, uh, this in itself would be very difficult. So the idea is to is to factor the whole change into tiny, tiny uh, atomic changes and uh, in a comparative manner. Okay, so uh, I think it's clearer with an example. So let's continue our video. So we're still studying Ati, Bola and Maru, and now I'm looking for now I'm looking for those cross marks. Those cross marks mean say that, for example, the north word here uh, doesn't even uh, cannot come from a proto burmish uh, etymon according to the present theory of um, of, uh, of, uh, of the historical phonology of Maru. So yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm I'll be looking for those kind of things. Uh, yeah, I look for crosses, 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 crosses. And here's a good one. Okay, so if you look at it, then uh, there are two crosses here. So you have a whole correspondence pattern for which uh, the current theory doesn't work for any of the forms. So for far and for rely, uh, the the Maru form does not correspond, the actual aesthetic Maru form doesn't correspond to anything. And for to measure, uh, it corresponds to something, but you see in, in every other language is scare. Why is we here? It's, it's impossible. So here is a problem. So what's the problem here? You see, you have this, uh, you have this uh, a vowel in proto burmish which uh, gives e in Ati and e in Bola. It's the same vowel, it's the same vowel everywhere in Ati and Bola, e and e. However, in Maru, sometimes it's e and sometimes it's a. So earlier we have like uh, forgotten, we, we, we didn't see that some vowel, some of the air vowels could become R. And uh, what's the condition? Okay, so the, be, sh, n, and v, g, n. Okay, here is it. So basically um, you have velas and v, well, v is the, I think the, the, the sound change from proto burmish word to maru ver could be quite uh, could be quite uh, recent so yeah the idea is that uh, maybe the proto burmish vowel a uh, change, uh, changes into r after velas including the labial velar approximate okay now we found our problem so uh, for demonstration purposes, I start with um, I start with inventing a very bad solution. So here's the bad solution. So first, here's the sound law. The 
that changes air into R mechanically, mechanically without taking into account the, phon the phonetic conditioning. Also, the placement of the uh, also the placement of the the sound law is wrong. The sound change is wrong. So you get air to R here, but of um, but here is a is an already existing example in uh, Maru, uh, an existing sound change in Maru where R changes into all. So uh, of course we we can we can uh, we can uh, predict that our uh, bad version changes uh, into R, which then get changes into all, which is not what we want. Okay. So what we get well for the worth that we're actually interested about, we get nothing. So um, what did not have a reconstruction? So for example, far doesn't have English written now neither. So yeah, the only, pro the only difference is that it was uh, uh, the wrong, uh, the theoretical reconstruction was there, but the current theoretical reconstruction is wrong, both are wrong. However, and here we see the beauty of the KPM interface. So, yeah, uh, basically you have two rows. The first row corresponds to the old uh, transducer and the second row corresponds to the new transducer. And it checks if your, if your new transducer actually explains the current forms better or worse than the old transducer. In this case, it's uh, worse and you get, and of course, since it's a systematic degradation of the, of the quality of the hypothesis, you get a huge swath of red with frowning faces mm, across a whole correspondence pattern, which uh, is Kepa's way of telling you that something went terribly wrong. Okay, so now uh, we uh, are reminded of uh, our historical linguistic 101 and uh, the idea uh, that, uh, well, uh, sound laws have uh, consequences. And so we have, uh, so we put it into a better place and we get these smiley faces telling us that, okay, now the actual attested form va is properly reconstructed to the pan Burmish etymon where, hooray. However, of course, you still get this huge swath of red, sad stuff. Okay, now we are going to um, do things seriously. So we remember that it, okay, it goes after velas. So you know, what are the velas? Kg and we remember there is this W and maybe aspiration. So yeah, it happens after velas. And wonderful. So yeah, we have Okay, what happened? Gosh, okay. So yeah, it uh, did it right for far and measure, but not for rely. Why? Because of course, yeah, rely has this ng, and yeah, you see, uh, yeah, 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 I meant to do this um, thing, thing wrong in the beginning for demonstration purposes, but now it caught me actually in an actual error. So, Okay, here's the right version of the sound law. G -g -g we finally got the ng. And okay. Okay, so yeah. And yeah, I should feel very happy about this uh, this um, this kind of thing because you when you get like a whole correspondence pattern with uh, smiley faces. Uh, in green, then yeah, then it's a then it's a new 
situation, a new sound change that is now properly accounted where it wasn't before. However, the, we still need to change, uh, we still need to check if it doesn't make anything worse. So we do, uh, okay, because it's very bad. I type the frowning face into search and search tells me that there is no frowning face in the thing. Okay, so I'm very happy about my new sound law in Bola where air changes into R after V does. Okay, so the discussion. So yeah, for the for the transducer debugging part, well, uh, so first you get this uh, visualization, uh, the China SEST style forward uh, correspondence charts, which provides the necessary and minimal information for generating the correct hypotheses. And the next thing is incrementality. So basically, yeah, it's very dangerous to change uh, transducers. So we have this kind of atomic change, uh, diff and report with uh, smiling and frowning faces, the minute loop, which uh, ensures that if you are going to do a trade-off, you, you know that you're doing a trade-off and if you do an improvement, it's an improvement, and if it, it's not, it's not. And the third thing is iter iterativeness, iterativity. So yeah, uh, the uh, what do coxes do in this um, part? Well, when you have better coxes, you get more examples. For example, I think uh, the reason that uh, we didn't uh, catch this uh, R is that uh, there were too few coxes in the first version of the fishing. So, so when you have one example, you are not really sure if something needs to do, be done about it. And also, when they're checked, when they are properly, um, when when you when you when you get the rubbish out of any out of a computer algorithm generated uh, coxet, you also get less red herrings and you get just a much uh, much clearer picture of the of the historical phonology yeah, so that's basically it so yeah uh, we just talked about the uh, transducer debugging as a part of the iterative workflow so when you get better coxets they can they can generate a good correspondence patterns for you to uh, um, debug uh, your transducers to make improvements in your hypotheses in, uh, in, in an iterative and uh, instant feedback way. That's basically it. So yeah, uh, yeah. So sorry for this thing being a bit, a little bit technical. But I think if we're really going to talk about uh, how to make computers actually useful for historical linguistics, we will need to see from the beginning to the end how you can, uh, how you can make this uh, this uh, workflow. Uh, consistent with itself and uh, iterative and stuff. Okay, that's it. And so uh, future directions. Okay, so yeah, we're still working on uh, the current uh, incarnation of the uh, of the CAPER methodology. So um, with a view of producing a really good um, Etymological dictionary of Flemish languages, and uh, uh, frankly, I don't program that well. So yeah, uh, but yeah, just uh, just an idea. So um, putting it more seriously, so we see that uh, a lot of uh, things are greatly simplified by the fact that we are working on monosyllabic languages. So the Mm, basically, the thing is that uh, the first the alignment problem, which is really hard, uh, is simplified. So in order to uh, address the alignment problem, I think we'll at some point need to um, make much better transducer engines than, than the kind of, you know, it's like a peak, uh, it's like a pearl, pearl uh, regular expressions versus real regular expressions. Um, as long as you have this bidirectionality, I think uh, we should actually explore ways to to put more stuff into it. And also, uh, 
since uh, we uh, since with monosyllabic languages we don't really care about like uh, paradigmatic morphology or analogy which um, which uh, which destroys the perfect lautgesetzlich uh, relationship between the inflected form in the daughter language and the inflected form in the source in the proto language and yeah uh, first uh, we need to think about um, like even encoding them in a, in a rigorous and machine readable and machine verifiable and way is an open problem. Uh, so let's end, uh, let me end this uh, talk um, by uh, saying some good words about uh, transducers. So uh, I think uh, at some point uh, uh, with this and other technologies, uh, it can it can bring us to uh, to something that is uh, uh, in French we say democratisé, which uh, in English is like de gatekept. So um, for Indo-European linguistics, you, 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 you get an actual discipline and people work on it. Uh, so yeah, uh, so people talk in the um, laziest, uh, most symbolic way possible, uh, but uh, for them it's, uh, it's doable, but like for, uh, for, for minority languages, uh, we need to be very frank and I don't think we're, we're getting, we're getting, we're getting, we're getting 300 professors bickering with each other on, uh, on one uh, tiny uh, language family um, in in the in the jungles of North Laos, it, it doesn't work like this. So, so what we can do is to is to make is to make our hypothesis transparent and uh, uh, so easy to change and easy to understand. And so a kind of uh, a kind of less institutionalized, less uh, intense cooperation could still uh, move us towards a, a more reputable future for the historical linguistics of world's languages. Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you very much.